So Locke reiterates again that personal identity consists not in the identity of a substance. So it's not the same, you know, mental substance, the same physical substance, but the identity of consciousness. Now, apparently the mayor of Queensboro allegedly thought that uh, he had the same soul as Socrates. And so Locke um, discusses this. So suppose that were true. Socrates, the mayor of Queensboro, had the same uh, soul. Well, they wouldn't therefore be the same person on Locke's view, because same soul doesn't mean the same person. But if they had the same consciousness, they would be the same person. And he continues with his Socrates example, uh, imagining, you know, that there's a waking Socrates who has a consciousness and a sleeping Socrates who has another distinct consciousness. And on his view, they would not be the same person. And so tying it back again to punishment and reward, to punish the waking Socrates for what sleeping Socrates thought and waking Socrates was not conscious of would be wrong. And he draws another analogy. Again, it's comparing two things and contending because they're alike in certain ways, they're alike in this other way. And he said to punish a person, you know, this uh, sort of weird Socrates with a waking consciousness and a distinct uh, sleeping consciousness to punish uh, one for what the other did would be analogous to punch punishing a twin for what one what the other twin did simply because you can't tell them apart. Now he does consider the problem of loss of memory because if a person is their consciousness and consciousness seems to be primarily memory, suppose you lose some parts of your memory beyond all possible retrieval. Now intuitively, and this is something our good dead friend David Hume will bring up later, it would seem that you'd be the same person that did those actions and had those thoughts that you were once conscious of, but now you've forgotten them. So how does he reply to this? Well, his reply is to get linguistic, essentially to focus on language, something that will come back when we talk about Hume to really plague and haunt Hume. So he says, we must notice what the word I is applied to here. And his claim is, this would apply to the same human, not the same person. So if we assume the same human is the same person, the term I is easy to suppose is standing for the same person. But if his scenario is correct, if it's possible for the same human to have distinct consciousnesses at different times that don't, that are not connected, then the same person at different times would be different persons. Now Locke supports his view that, you know, if someone loses their parts of their memory beyond possible retrieval, they would not be that, that person. So how does he support this, this view? Because, you know, it's on the face of it seems kind of, kind of strange. So what he says is this. There are two main reasons why we should accept it and even go so far as to claim, you know, everyone kind of agrees with him. So the first one is the legal argument. He contends that uh, human laws don't punish mad people for what the sober person did, nor the sober person for what the mad person did. Thus, he says, this makes them two persons. So that's his sort of legal argument. Now, the argument does have the obvious problem because it may be that they don't do this. You know, think of like how effective the insanity defense is not in the United States. And it could also be that the reasoning behind it is not that, you know, mad people and non insane people are different persons. It's that a person's, you know, responsibility is mitigated by madness. So you could take the view that it's the same person, mad and sane. But he takes them to be two people. The next is the language argument. He says when we speak, uh, you know, kind of everyday talk, uh, we say that a person is not themselves or beside themselves. And 
he takes this ever this everyday talk to be an indicator that there is a distinction in the persons and so the language argument now one reasonable criticism of this argument would be that when people talk like that they're not making metaphysical claims about personal identity they're just you know kind of empty expressions or expressing that the person is just acting differently so if someone says that you know they they're married to someone and things go terrible and they say you're not the person i married are they literally making a metaphysical claim about identity or are they you know essentially making the statement the person has changed quite a bit and they no longer you know like what the person you know is you know same person just different qualities but he thinks the law argument and the legal argument uh the language argument suffice to prove his point Locke then considers a problem about punishment and he raises the matter of isn't a uh, drunk human and sober human the same person and he brings up you know a legal point namely that someone uh, who's drunk it commits you know some misdeed is punished for it even though they don't remember remember doing it and so what Locke is is noting here is that the drunk defense doesn't work it you know generally doesn't work uh, even today and so he does seem to be right you know if someone is arrested for some sort of crime their defense of I was too drunk to, to remember what I was doing therefore you know I shouldn't be punished would generally not not succeed similarly it brings up the point about um, a person who you know walks in their sleep is regarded as being the same person and answerable for whatever misdeeds they might do while asleep now given Locke's view though this would seem to be you know if if the person is only justly punished when they did it then if a drunk person doesn't have the memory they have the sober person and vice versa they're not the same person likewise if the sleeping person and the awake person don't have the same memory they're not the same person so punishing one for what the other did would be un, unjust but he does know in the case of the laws the punishment is just why well essentially it's a epistemic issue which is this the uh, judges and jurors really have no way of knowing that what is true and what is not true whether the person is truly honestly you know they do not honestly recall and hence under Locke's view not the same person or if they're not telling the truth so ignorance due to drunkenness or sleep according to Locke is not accepted as a plea and correctly so again it's an epistemic problem the judge and jury cannot know whether the person remembers or not now what about true and ultimate justice because again Locke is or was a devout Christian so he's very concerned about ultimate justice and he notes that although punishment is connected to personality and personality to consciousness and the drunk was perhaps not conscious of what you know what he or she did they can be justly punished because the fact has been established that you know the same human did the crime so and the jury can't tell whether it's the same person or not but in, they have no way of knowing but it's just to punish in that case but in the case of ultimate justice Locke says when all secrets of all hearts shall be laid open no one shall be made to answer for what he knows nothing of but shall receive his doom his conscience accusing or the, or excusing him and so what he seems to be implying here is that if the person truly did not remember you know when they were doing something you know terrible while drunk they would have no recollection they would not be the same person and god of course being all-knowing would would know this now this can lead to some you know problematic scenarios so if you have someone suppose you have uh two people committing you know a terrible crime and then one of them is um you know sh uh, shot and killed and you're given you know assume a heaven hell kind of scenario they're 
end up, you know, being punished, you know, by God because they got killed and they know ex and they have total recollection of their horrible, horrible crimes. But suppose the other person is shot and they're hit in the hit in the head, and their memory is wiped out. So they have no recollection. It wipes it like way back, and so they have no recollection of any bad things they did. And as far as they know, they never did any of that stuff. But of course, they're you know they're convicted, and imagine their death penalty place. They're put to death. And given Locke's view, God would say, "Well, you have no memory of this, so no punishment." Now, of course, a counter to that is that perhaps you know God being all powerful would do like a memory store, be like, okay, your memory's back, you remember all this stuff, that's you, and now it is, you know, punishment time. So that's his view. If you remember it, it's you, and you can be justly punished or rewarded for it. If you don't, it's not you. You can still be justly punished or rewarded for it in, you know, the practical sense, but essentially don't worry if, because God will sort it out in the end, or so he claims. So Locke finishes up his look at personal identity with some odd cases. And these will seem somewhat like uh, sci-fi or you know, fantasy cases. But he's considering them in the context of his, of his theory. So the first option is this. Suppose you have two distinct consciousnesses. And they occupy the same body. They share the same body. One controls a body during the day. One by night. And this would be kind of an, a case of not multiple personality, but multiple persons, where they would be, you know, given Locke's view, distinct people. Now let's imagine another kind of weird case. Imagine that you have a single consciousness that has two distinct bodies, that it's able to, you know, switch between them and, you know, occupy, you know, one body and then... You know, I guess whenever it suits it, it goes and occupies another. You know, again, kind of a fantasy or sci-fi case, like possession or something. Now, given Locke's view, personal identity is determined by the consciousness. So he does note that, um, you know, maybe the thinking substance is immaterial, but it may part with its past consciousness and be restored, such as when people forget. And so a person may remember and forget by day and night. And according to Locke, there'd be two persons with the same spirit and two persons with the same uh, body. And in the other, you know, weird case, you would have, um, you know, somehow a single conscious able to, you know, be in one body at one time, one point at another. But given Locke's view, the self, the personal identity, is not determined by the identity or diversity of substance. Uh, and the reason for this, according to Locke, is it cannot be sure of this, by only, but only identity of consciousness. And this kind of points also to why it takes consciousness to be the basis, because you can be sure, possibly, of your own memory, but the thing about being knowing, do I have the same immaterial substance? Uh, do I have the same material substance? No. And so that's Locke's view of personal identity. And the key to the Locke's view is this. According to Locke, the same person is the same consciousness. Same consciousness, same person. Differs, different consciousness, different person. To be the same human is a matter of having you know, the body and the life. And so the key is always for Locke, consciousness. Wherever your consciousness goes, that's where you go.